live stream. All righty -o. So, last night, uh, I did a live stream where I got some cool stuff out of uh, an old computer, like this DVD disk drive. I also uh, got some suggestions in a live stream a little bit ago to build some of these things. So, in this video, we're going to be building a laser from the CBG drive. We're going to be making a function generator, kind of. Uh, maybe use some micro transformers. Make a ring oscillator, someone wanted to do that. And a few other things. So, let's get started. We're going to put aside these other things right now, because that's not important. We're going to crack open this CD drive. So we got some screws right here. We'll have to pull those open. See, so what we want to do uh, and make, want to try and get this laser out of here. The laser is all we care about. Now, a, a while back, I made this LM317 uh, laser driver right here, because it's a constant current power supply. Uh, I may use this, or I may just use my power supply up here, because it has a constant current limiting setting, and so I can use that to limit the current in the power supply. Anyway, I gotta pull out this cover from the DVD drive. These DVD drives have all kinds of screws to get them out. Then we're gonna build a good circuit. Heck, we may even blow up some capacitors. So... If you look inside there, the laser is going to be somewhere underneath that circuit board. I really don't feel like getting a sound. Oh my goodness. Oh, never mind. I thought that this, uh, I see it come off its solder joints. Anyway, this is the control board. Some, like, sticky glue on it. This is not important, and that can be thrown away. And here is where the laser is at. See, if you look down here, uh, you can see the laser inside this little trolley. Um, it's this little tiny thing right here, and you, it's got uh, four pins coming out. This pin actually isn't being used, so I'll have to mark that as not being used. But these two pins are probably positive and negative, and uh, that's the laser. So let's see if we can get that laser out of the DVD drive. This is always a hard part. You have to pull out the trolley, pull out everything. Not too hard, I guess. There it is. This DVD drive, I'm not going to use it right now. But we have a little trolley, and we've got some lasers inside there. Let's see if we can't extract the lasers, or even power it up. First of all, I'm going to turn on my soldering iron over here, so that way we can uh, desolder the laser. And if you look right there, you can see how it's attached. And that one pin isn't attached to anything, so we want to mark that, because that may be useful in the future. Now, I will be putting up more videos later. Uh, I've just been super busy right now, so I haven't had much time to make any videos. I've, also, I've got a video editing uh, right now. So this little pin right here, I'm going to mark it because it's no connection. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try and rip out this whole laser by first desoldering it. Oh, I think I may have bent one of those pins. Now, you don't want to heat this up too much, because this laser is very fragile. Alright, this is a pain. Looks like we need to remove the laser diode first. And to do that, we're going to have to remove this little cover. That cover just has a few electronic components inside it. And then we can use a soldering iron to pull off the laser diode. There we go. Yep, someone just said I need a circuit to power the laser, and I do indeed have a circuit to power it. 
this circuit right here can power the full laser. Here we go, I got the laser unhooked from its uh, demise. So there we got the laser inside there. It's all desoldered. So now what we have to do is we have to get in there and pull it out without breaking the thing. And here's the little lens that's on it right here. Maybe if I pull the lens out, I can remove the laser. Let me get uh, another screwdriver. So right here we have the laser. I got my trusty screwdriver. Let's see if we can pop it out. There we go. There's some progress. This little prism's in the way though. That did not sound good, but it came out. I'll have to go get some pliers. There's the prism. Along with some broken glass. That looks pretty cool. Check that out. It's like a filter for the camera. Cool. Uh, probably filters out UV light or something. Anyway, I can prop this prism out now. Now, the key here is not to break the laser. And dump all the junk inside my trash can. I really don't want to break this laser. Sometimes this is a hard thing to do. You know what, first let's test out the laser and make sure it even works before we go around messing with it. Now I'm not sure, but I think the case may be negative. So if we hook this up to a power supply, we may be able to get some lazing out of it. Uh, we'll turn this down, limit the current all the way, hook it up so this is positive. And that's negative, maybe slide a little piece of paper in between. All right, here's nothing. Now, I'm not wearing laser goggles, and that's not the best thing. Probably should be. Lasers kill. It seems we have a little red diode down there. Check that out. You can see the little red laser dot inside. That means the laser is probably working. If I turn it up more... Oh, and I just... I think I'm running too much current through that laser. As you can see, though, it is on. And it is running. Um, I think it's taking too much current at too low of a voltage. And so I don't think it works anymore. These lasers can be tricky sometimes. Alright, let's get building something else. Because that laser experiment didn't work out perfectly. Let's take a look at this little thing. Uh, somebody wanted me to make uh, an oscillator or a function generator. And now, what, let's just do something with this and make an op amp oscillator. Now, an op amp is this device. It's called a differential amplifier. 
And that pretty much means that we have two inputs and one output. One input is positive and one input is negative. Uh, I mean, those don't actually mean the voltages you have to put inside. It just means inverting and non-inverting. Uh, now, what happens is the output is going to swing to the difference in the two inputs. And so in this oscillator, we have a capacitor uh, and a resistor here. We have two resistors. And these resistors form a voltage divider. And so what's going to happen is when this oscillator turns on and this op amp is activated, then uh, this output is going to swing um, high just due to this resistor right here. And it's going to cause a differential in here. And there's going to be a fixed um, voltage difference on here that's in here. And it's going to charge up this capacitor slowly uh, through this resistor. And once this uh, reaches an equal... It's kind of hard to explain. Let's just build it. So we got a breadboard right here, and we've got the op amp. Alright, uh, stuff to make an ion lifter? Someone just asked about that. I've got a high voltage power supply, and I may be able to build an ion lifter out of that. I don't know. I've tried before, and I kind of got it to work, but then I didn't. I got some wires, I got my op amp. Let's take a look at the pinout of this op amp. This is an LM358. As you can see, we have um, two separate op amps within this one op amp. We've got output A, output B. For some reason, my camera just seemed weird. Inverting input A, non-inverting input A, and ground. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to connect this op amp to power and ground. So V++ is right here. The positive V minus is right here. It's ground goes to negative. Then we've got our inverting and non-inverting inputs and outputs. And so our output A is one. We're gonna set that over here because that's what we're going to use for our output um, in the oscilloscope. Then we've got our inputs right here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build the resistor and capacitor network among the inputs. And so let's get a few resistors and capacitors. I got a bunch of components from LCSC right here. Um, not sure. Let's use some 1K resistors. That should be pretty useful. Let's just make this out of all 1K resistors because I have a bunch of those. And just for the fun of it, we'll blow up a capacitor soon. So uh, what we got to do is follow the schematic. And we see that we have a voltage divider between the output, which is right here, and the inverting, the non-inverting input, which is plus. And that is right here. And we have another resistor as part of the voltage divider. We're going to put that between that and ground. So there are those two resistors. They're in place, hopefully. Now we're going to take another 1K resistor and put it between the output, which is right here, and the non-inverting input, right here. We're going to take another wire, and put one off here, and put it between here and ground. And we're going to use a capacitor in between this line and ground, and that's going to be determining our frequency of oscillation. Now this is not the best function generator circuit, but it will work. And um, I didn't explain this very well at the beginning, but what's going to happen is when you apply power to these two rails of the, of the op amp, then this, this output can drive either high or low based on the difference. So if you have one volt on the non-inverting and zero volts here, um, it's going to put out one volt because it's non-inverting. So there's going to be one volt on here. Um, 
if you put one volt on non on the inverting section and zero volts here, then it's going to be uh, negative one volt on the output because it's an inverting. So that's kind of how this little op amp thing works. And so what happens is um, when you start this up, there's going to be um, let me just think about this for a second. Um, when you start this up, the output should go um, high, or actually, I'm not sure. This should probably be low, because the output's going to start low, and this is going to be low, which is going to drop this as low, and... And when this is low and this is high, it's going to put a voltage on here. And that voltage is going to go through this resistor and charge the charge the capacitor. And once that capacitor is charged, it'll switch states. I'll explain this more when we have an oscilloscope hooked up to it. Let's hook up a capacitor. In between this and ground. Sorry for my bad explanation on how that circuit works. Um, it's been a while since I've done op amps. We're going to connect this to my bench power supply. Hopefully we should get some oscillations out of this circuit. So I'll connect this up. Now usually when you use an op amp circuit, you want to have a differential power supply. Uh, power supply. And that just means it has a negative and positive. I actually said the wrong thing. You just need a, a negative and positive power supply, not one with ground. But it should work like this. Actually, to get that kind of power supply, um, we're just going to use a virtual ground in here. And that just means we need some more resistors. And so we'll get a few 10k resistors. Got a few of them in here. So these 10k resistors are going to make a virtual ground for the oscilloscope to connect to. And pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to plug one into positive and one into negative, and one into um, negative and positive. So we make a voltage divider. So this is going to make our virtual ground to connect the oscilloscope to, to watch the outputs. So let's fire up the oscilloscope and fire up the power supply. I'll turn it on. There we go, we got it fired up. Let's get a good probe. Want to set the voltage pretty high. Just in case we blow out the power supply. And let's connect. Oh, you got an oscilloscope from the junkyard. That's awesome. That is a really cool thing. I wish I had a junkyard I could get an oscilloscope from. So let's connect this to the virtual ground. We'll connect this to the output. And something's not working right. As you can see. I'm not getting an output on the oscilloscope. That is the weirdest thing. Huh. Looks like my oscillator circuit with the op amp is not functioning correctly. Uh, that is odd indeed. Not sure why that is the case. I mean, it should be working. Just to give it a second, maybe we can get this oscillator circuit to run correctly. We got everything hooked up correctly. That's negative, that's positive. We got negative going to here, we got negative going to the negative of the op amp, uh, positive going there. We've got all the things 
in op amp A. For some reason, my power supply is at 17 volts. Um, I don't know, very interesting. Should be working right now, but it's not. Well, that's me trying to make uh, an op amp oscillator, and it's not working too well. Not sure why that is. I may need to change out this capacitor with maybe something a little bit lower. Maybe something a little bit higher. Maybe we were going up too high a frequency. Let's try one of these tiny caps. There we go. Let's see how well that works. These circuits are very touchy. We're still getting no output on the oscilloscope, which is the weirdest thing. We're just getting a negative 5 volt signal when we're putting 11 volts inside there. When this op amp circuit should be working just fine. Not sure why this is. We got the virtual ground. We got our resistors in the right place, it seems. We're not getting that ramp oscillation. Huh. Can't figure that out. Uh, I know last time you guys liked it when I blew up a capacitor, so might as well blow up another one. This is a good capacitor, too, so... Hold up. We got this thing. It's drawing a few... Actually, let me disconnect that. I will be right back with a uh, mobile for the capacitor. Let's pop this capacitor inside a bowl. That way when it blows up, it won't get everywhere. So we're pulling lots of current now, pulling over two amps. There we go. As you can see the capacitor blew up, and it kept all the smoke inside there. Caps are pretty fun to blow up sometimes. Let me take this outside where it won't smoke up my room. Right now this container is full of this toxic smoke. Let's take it this take it over here. Do not want to drop this, this is full of smoke. Nasty. We'll just put it out the doggy door. There we go. The bull's outside. There was a good capacitor explosion. A lot safer than some of my other explosions. As you can see, you can see the fractured bits of the capacitor down there. So uh, right here is what the inside looks like. And you can see that these, these metal plates, this coil of metal inside the capacitor, there's all this fluff. This is like the electrolytic uh, and the insulators inside it. You can see we got this cool can right here. This is the can that the capacitor's in. Uh, this is the metal shield on the outside. And we got all the bits on the inside. So I know you guys like capacitor explosions. My last uh, live stream, I blew up one. And it was liked by a lot of people. So there's another one. Without stinking up the room. Let's take a look at a 555 timer oscillator, because I can't get this one to work. 555 timer oscillator is a little bit easier to make. So we'll come up here, grab a 555 timer. And hopefully power it up. So I'll remove some of these things, some of these connections in my breadboard. Uh, I don't know why that uh, op amp oscillator did not work. I'll have to look at that sometime else. But, um,. 
Let's replace that with a 555. There we go. Let's look up the 555 pinout. I don't have that on memory. There, 555 timer pinout. And so we have this thing. And then we have um, ground, power supply, discharge, trigger, output, reset, and threshold. And so if we take a look at this, we first want to wire up uh, the power supply, which is positive. That's the most important part. Wire that to positive. We want to wire negative to ground, of course. Negative is always right here. And then we want to wire up a few other things inside this circuit. Namely, the 4, which is reset. We want to wire that to power. A reset always needs to be connected to there. Um, we also need to connect um, threshold 6 and trigger 2. I'm pretty sure. And then 3 is the output, and so we're going to connect that one just to the oscilloscope output. And uh, we need to put a resistor and a capacitor inside here, so we want to put capacitor a resistor from output to threshold threshold is six which is connected to two which is trigger and then we want to put a capacitor from there to ground and hopefully we should get a good oscillator now, I've already blown up a lot of my small capacitors so it's probably not blow up anymore but uh we'll use this capacitor this one's pretty good hopefully we should get a good oscillation Try this capacitor. It's hopefully, we'll get a better oscillation than uh, last time. Connect this up to power and ground. Hopefully, we should uh, get this thing running. Running good. So, we got the power supply hooked up. Let's take a look at the oscilloscope. Hope for the best. Oh, there we go. We got something. So if you look right here, I'm not sure what's up with my oscilloscope. But we got some weird oscillations inside here. So this right here is each of the things in the square wave. Um, as you, we can figure out the operating frequency by clicking store which is right here. I'm going to click that store button. And then you'll have these little cursors that you can move around. You may not be able to see them right now. But you can move those cursors and you can set them on peak to peak of the circuit so we can figure out the oscillating frequency. And so on each up curve or each peak that is one oscillation of the thing. So that is about 5 kilohertz and so this 505 is operating at that now, someone is asking what's the difference between a 555 timer and an op amp. So a 555 timer is a dedicated IC for oscillating things, and it's a really multi-purpose device. So right now, this 555 timer is um, hooked up with a capacitor and a resistor, so the only external component you need when operating it in the simplest mode is that, whereas in, in an op amp, it'll make a ramp oscillator, and the ramp oscillator needs these four resistors and capacitors. And so it makes it a little more complicated then the 555 timer circuit. And the 555 timer circuit is way more versatile because you can use it on all kinds of different things. But um, that is the frequency it's making right now at 5 volts. Now we can connect this to a speaker and actually hear that out loud. Let me grab a speaker. So here's a speaker right now, and you saw that there's a 5 kilohertz uh, signal on the oscilloscope screen of a square wave. Now, you can actually use a 555 timer to create a function generator, like someone is asking, because it can be used to create all kinds of different frequencies, uh, mostly square wave. Now let's connect the speaker in here.
And now we'll connect the other end of the speaker to ground. We should hear a sound. Oh, can't hear anything. And we're drawing, we're drawing too much current. Something not good happened. For some reason, this doesn't want to work. Huh. That's interesting. I think uh, the reason why this isn't wanting to work is that the 5.5 timer is hooked up in such a way that um, the output drives the other parts of the oscillator. And so this, when you hook up the speaker, this low impedance makes it not work. If we use a piezo buzzer, that should probably serve us better. This piezo buzzer actually came out of a, of a microwave. Yeah, well, normally the 8 ohm load from the speaker isn't too much, but in the way I have it hooked up, let me find a pencil real quick. Um, it makes it so the oscillator drives it low. Because if we look at this schematic, you see that the um, output right here has actually a resistor going to trigger. Um, and that's actually the, the voltage driving that. Now, if you want to make it so it can drive higher impedance loads, then you can actually... Um, have that go straight from positive and have the circuit hooked up in a different way. But I like it hooked up this way. It makes it work very good. Um, we still have the signal right here. So if I hook this up to the piezo, and we hook that up to ground, there you go. If you can hear that, that is our output sound. Whoa solidify that in place with one of these there we go so you can see that that is working good we got the piezo buzzer attached to the oscillator circuit and you can see that our uh, our uh, oscillations are still working pretty good if I set this to AC we can look at it in the middle but um it's interesting to look at this because we got these little oscillations at each end of the square wave. Cool little oscillations there. Anyway, that's the sound that the little buzzer is making. And you can actually change that sound based on what resistor value you put in here. Even I'm even me just touching this with my fingers can alter its oscillation frequency because I am changing the resistance just slightly and that's changing the oscillations so what's happening in this 555 timer circuit is that we've got this um, resistor and capacitor and so we have a power supply and that charges through a resistor this capacitor And what happens is we got this trigger right here and threshold detector. And so what happens is once this... Oh, let me disconnect that. That's annoying. Once this um, wire, which goes to the trigger and threshold pins, um, reaches a certain voltage, it makes something happen. So let's say this is a positive 9 volts and this is ground. Now based on what resistor and what capacitor are right here, it's going to change the time base on how long it's going to take to charge this. And so the current is going to flow through here into the capacitor and it's going to charge up the plates. And so the voltage right here is going to rise in kind of a sine wave format. And now what's going to happen is as soon as this reaches a certain threshold, then it's going to cause one of these pins to go to ground and that's going to discharge the capacitor through ground. And so it's going to go up, and it's going to go down like this. And so that is going to create that little wave on here. And we can probably visualize that using the oscilloscope. So if I connect my oscilloscope wire to uh, one of the pins, the middle pin between the resistor and the capacitor, 
if I can find one. Right here. Then we should see that waveform. As you can see, it's right there. So that's the waveform that I was just describing to you, where it looks like that. And so let's find another oscilloscope probe and connect that to the output of the device. And we should hopefully be seeing something pretty cool. So we'll set this to two, two channel mode. Uh oh, gotta do alternation. And so that shows us the two alternating waves. And uh, if I connect this part to another one of my wires, we should see something happen. It's pretty cool. If I connect this here. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Okay, there we go. There we go. I got this to work. If we zoom in on both of these, we, can, we should be able to see it. So right here, you can see that we have our two waves. And as you can see right here, if I hit store, we can see that as soon as this wave, which is the, the voltage of the resistor and the capacitor, uh, reaches a certain voltage, it triggers this uh, square wave to go high. And so it's going to go up here, it's going to curve up, and it's going to cause this to go high, and it's going to go up. And then it's going to discharge, and as soon as it discharges, it's going to cause this to go low again. We can probably see this by adjusting the time base out. Um, it, it looks pretty cool because all these line up. When it turns on, this uh, turns off. And when this reaches a low voltage, it goes on. So that's a pretty cool thing to look at and visualize. Now, someone just asked if I could put an LDR inside this device and use it as a theremin. Well, I've actually done that. Let's take a look at some of my older uh, things that I've made in here. If I move my thing just in the right way, we can see a few other electronic projects that I've made in the past. And one of these is a theremin that actually uses uh, two 555 five, five timers. And so I know I showed this in a previous video, but we'll take a look at it again. So I'll set this up here, and we will connect it to my power supply. I'll disconnect my oscilloscope from there, because although that's a cool waveform, it's not necessary anymore. I'll disconnect that from power. We don't need that breadboard anymore. And we will plug this into our power supply, and I'll show you how this theremin works. First of all, I need to get something connected to the speaker. I can probably just use a headphone. Actually, I can't figure... I don't have the connections available right now. But anyway, what this does is I have a light, an LDR right there. And that is one of the resistors in the 555 timer. Along with these two uh, variable resistors, actually three of them. And this can make a circuit that will... Uh, change the frequency based on the light applied to it. So that's pretty cool. Let's do one more circuit and then I'll be done. Uh, there's not many people on this live stream. Someone previously suggested I make a ring oscillator. And this is one of the parts of a ring oscillator. Now a ring oscillator has as many parts as you want, but this is just one part of a ring oscillator. And what we've got is we've got a, a MOSFET and we've got a resistor going off the output and we've got a capacitor on the gate and we've got a wire going from the gate pretty much what happens is we have like three of these in series together this output connects to the gate of the next MOSFET and so on and pretty much what this does is it makes it so um, this this charge here I'll show you once we get the circuit built we'll disconnect all the other stuff in here 
so that is not necessary any longer. And I will look for... Okay, an octopus adapter component tester. I'll look that up and I'll see if I can make that for you later. But let's get some end channel MOSFETs. That is what we need for this. Now I could use the small end channel MOSFETs, but I don't really have any right now. Uh, we're going to use the 50N06. I have a bunch of those MOSFETs. Actually, I have some of these ones. Uh, these ones may be useful in this circuit because they're so small. So let's take a look at what this MOSFET actually is in the pinout of it. I can get out this stupid paper. So the pinout of this little tiny MOSFET is source gate drain. And so let's write this down real quick. Um, source is one, this is two, this is three. And so let's remember that when we hook up these MOSFETs. Now it's important to use MOSFETs for this uh, device because they're voltage dependent, uh, not current dependent in the gate. And if you had a voltage uh, current dependent gate inside uh, BJT transistor, then what would happen is this uh, capacitor would just drain through here through the gate because it has a relatively high resistance and it wouldn't it would make it not work anymore. So let's put a few more uh, MOSFETs inside there so we can connect them all. And we'll see if we can get this ring oscillator to work. If that's even possible. I'll just put up put the components back here. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was I was wondering like everybody's feedback on these live streams. Someone just uh, said they liked them all. I uh, know. Yeah, this is a two and seven hundred MOSFET. Um, yeah, I've been having fun doing these live streams. They're a lot less work than making an actual video. So we need to get some capacitors, preferably the 2.2 .2 microfarad ones. I know I have some. I think I may have just blown up my last capacitor. That's a 2.2 .2 microfarad. This is a 0.47, not going to be used. This is a 22 microfarad, not good. 0.1. It's kind of hard to find the right capacitor. 10. I used to have all these sorted out, but not anymore. This is another 2.2. .2. We just need one more and we should be good. 4.7, that's not going to cut it. 47, not going to cut it. 2.2. .2. There we go. We have our three 2.2 .2 capacitors. Uh, those go from the gate to ground, and the gate is number 2, pin number 2. First, let me straighten out some of the pins of these capacitors with my pliers. And then we will connect them all up. So right now I'm just bending them so I can connect them from here to something else. Now the hard part is we gotta connect it from two to one, two to one, and two to one. That wasn't too bad. We got our three capacitors now and our three MOSFET transistors. Uh, let's wire all the pin ones to ground. And then after we wire all pin ones to ground, we can connect the entire device uh, with all the resistors inside it. And so, uh, according to this schematic, we need to uh, take a one mega ohm resistor and connect the um, the source of the MOSFET with a one mega ohm resistor to the gate of the next MOSFET in the chain. So we're gonna need three one mega ohm resistors. So we go up here. We have a whole bunch of oh. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. Thank you, David Ellis, for reminding me. Yeah, the polarities of these caps need to be fixed. In fact, these two caps have the wrong polarity inside them. So we got to switch these around so the black part or ground is always changed to ground. Uh, then that should hopefully work for us. 
You can take one mega ohm resistor and bring it from the source, which is pin 3, to the gate of the next one. Hopefully this ring oscillator is going to be pretty cool. We'll grab another one mega ohm. We'll connect it from the source of this one to the gate of the next. And we'll connect the last one from the source to just nothing. And this is because we need to connect that to the gate of the other one. So we're going to bring that over here and to this gate. Oh, for some reason that something is wrong here. We have the gate, the capacitor to ground. For some reason, one is grounded. Ooh, I connected it in the wrong spot. These resistors actually need to go to the middle end of it. Had that wrong. Because the gate is the middle. There we go, so that should be right. That should be correct. And so now, I think we got all those connected. Now all we have to do is connect LEDs with, uh, with a 330 ohm resistor to it. And so we'll go to my resistor packet. And we'll get some good resistor values. And hopefully we should get this ring oscillator to work. Uh, typically, this 387 resistor will work probably. I mean, it's not the exact one, but I mean, it's close enough. So we'll take these three resistors and bring them from positive to an LED on each side. Actually, we'll bring these resistors to the third one, which is the source or something. And we'll connect them over here. Make sure none of the pins touch. If any of these metal bits touch, it's not good for you. It means your ring oscillator is probably not going to work. There we go. We're almost there. Sorry for all the background noise. It's just family making noise is normal. Uh, we then have our three resistors right here. Now it's time to get some LEDs for the ring oscillator. We got some uh, LEDs, green, white, red. That should be fine. Um, we'll take those LEDs and we'll connect them up. Let's take some green LEDs. I like green the best. Now, it's key to remember the polarity of different LEDs. Um, inside these green LEDs, we got the long one, and the long one is positive, and the short one is negative. And so we want to tie the long one, which is positive, to the positive rail of the power supply. And we're going to tie the short one to ground. So long one, positive end, short one to the resistor. Short one to the resistor. And short one to the resistor. So, we got our three LEDs all wired up. Now let's connect them with this to positive, each one. Now I've got this cool box of all my different wires that I can use. Now all these are pretty helpful. I've just acquired these over the years. But it's really key to have these wires when you're building breadboard circuits. Except the only issue with this is all my wires are all messed up. They're not organized at all. It's going to go to positive. This is going to go to negative. We need one wire to positive. And we need one more wire from the wire box. This one should do. And that wire is going to go from this to positive. So we have our three LEDs, we have all our transistors in the ring oscillator circuit. Now the key is to see if this runs. Let's connect this up, with this to positive and this to ground. And hopefully, I'll turn up the voltage a little bit and we'll see if this thing can actually run as normal. Right now we have nothing, we're drawing zero current. If I turn up this voltage, 
seems that we have one LED lighting up. Now I'm not sure... We need to get more. I'm not sure why this isn't working. Uh, what we should have is we should have all these LEDs turning on and then all of them turning off, but that's not running right. I turn up the voltage, nothing happens. I think everything's correct, connected in the right polarity. It's odd. Very odd. Uh, maybe if I get a little boost. Nothing's happening. That's odd. Very odd indeed. Um, it seems like everything has been hooked up correctly, but we're still only getting one LED to light up. And that's not correct for what we want our circuit to do. Oh. Next LED just lit up. I think what's happening is those one mega ohm resistors are just taking a while to make this ring oscillator run. Um, yeah, so what's happening is these ring oscillators are just taking a really long time. It's because the 1 mega ohm resistor and the 2.2 microfarad capacitor, that's just taking a long time. We can speed up the process probably by just shorting out one of these resistors. I don't know. But the next one just lit up. We haven't gotten the final one to light up yet. Yeah, the gate of the first MOSFET is connected to the final output of the final one. So we got the final output going to the gate of the first one. And still, we're not getting any running time on this thing. That is weird. Now I'm thinking that maybe if we wait a little bit longer than this last LED will light, but I, I'm not sure now. I mean, it should be working. We got two LEDs to light up. This ring oscillator is a little bit complicated. I'm thinking it's probably the capacitor that's taking too long. But hopefully, since this is almost lit up, we should get this thing to start oscillating soon. Not sure why it's not oscillating yet. Um, maybe if I short out this capacitor. I mean, I know about, I know a lot about electronics, but I'm not perfect in everything that I know. So, uh, can't figure out. Do you have any, uh, comment suggestions on why this is not oscillating like it should be? These lights should be turning on and then off, and all of them in kind of a little series and sequence. But it's not doing that. If anyone could enlighten me, that would be helpful. So the gate is in the middle. Now if I connect the gate to a positive source, maybe, maybe, we can get something to run. Oh, I just... That's weird. If I touch this to here, well, now it's not doing anything anymore. Maybe if I drain this to ground. See, if I touch this here, the capacitor seems to be charging correctly uh, with the one mega ohm resistor. And if I if I drain this to ground, the light turns off. And if I put this one to positive, that light turns on. But if I put this one to positive, the final light doesn't turn on. But it turns off the first light. Ah. I do not know what's going on anymore. I'm thinking these one mega ohm resistors were a little bit too big for my experiment. Which is why it's not running correctly right now. But anyway. I may be able to get this to run soon. You know, I'll get this to run soon. I may make a video on this ring oscillator. But for now, uh, I'm running out of time. I have to do some other stuff. So that's probably all for today. Force the gate of the non. 
Yeah, you're right. One big ohm is a long time constant. Uh, here, let's force it high. So this is the gate of the one that's not working. And if I force it high, it still doesn't work. But if I force this gate high, it turns on. Um, I don't know. Maybe something is not working with that. Maybe if I force the gate of the first one high, then it'll make it run. This is a really interesting device that I can't get it to work perfectly yet. But, anyway. As good as we're going to get right now. Uh, I'll eventually get this working later. I'm not going to give up. I don't give up on things. I should get that working and I'll probably get the other oscillators working. I still have this list of the things people wanted. Um, I'll eventually get this working. As always, thanks for watching and stay tuned for next time.